judge's uh, custody taking situation. That, that, that's right. Uh, that's correct, Judge Erie. The, uh, there was some time before the interrogation began uh, that you heard say, and in the interrogation room. However, throughout the interrogation, Mr. McCain made, made it very clear, Judge Erie, that uh, he was worried he was going to die if they arrested him. I mean, we all the room yes, there if the initial interrogation was videotaped. When the <clears throat> deputy chief came in and they apologized to him for the way he arrested him in place. About videotaping? Yeah, because you said something was, it was, something was objected to a trial, but was the initial part of it when they brought him in and they said, hey, we're real sorry how this took place. Was that video? Um, part of it was, is best my recollection. Uh, I, I think Judge Richardson, the part of that was uh, uh, on the video. I certainly remember it being part of the testimony at the suppression hearing. I don't recall exactly how much the deputy chief of police was on the video. Absolutely. What's the... What's the time difference between the, the arrest scenario, arrest situation, and the point in which the deputy chief or the detective apologizes and expresses concern about the way that he had been arrested? Is there how big a <coughs> Judge Noel, I would call it hard on the heels of the arrest. Okay. And the reason I would describe it that, that way. Is that a watch somewhere? Like, <laughs> And it's like, that, that's a great point. Three seconds. Yeah. There, there was no temporal, you know, proximity in the record that I could point to. The best I could do, Judge Newell, is that Mr. McCain was still upset enough uh, from what happened at the arrest scene, being shot at, thought he was going to die. He certainly raised that uh, sure. during the interrogation. So my best answer to that, Judge Newell, is hard on the heels of the arrest. I know they took him directly from the arrest scene to the PD. Uh, that, that's about the best I could answer that. Well, why is it, though, that these efforts that the police are doing in order to home to lower temperatures, why isn't that something that actually inures to the benefit? Why isn't that something that would allow for a more robust understanding of maybe a voluntary statement? <clears throat> Our position, Your Honor, uh, Judge Noel, is that uh, given the fact that they, that both Detective Duke and the Deputy Chief of Police agreed with, uh, uh, with Mr. McCain, about how he was mistreated at the scene, re-heightened the concerns with Mr. McCain as our position. That, that's why we think that, and, and okay. why we think, you know, I thought I was going to die at the scene, Judge Noel. That's, thank you for that question. What prompted the arrest? The death of the officer, Your Honor? Yes, sir. And what was the time lapse between that and the arrest? Uh, it was later in the day. Uh, uh, he, uh, he was seen in his vehicle, <coughs> uh, reported and the police and the SWAT team came out then to uh, arrest him in his vehicle. So it, it was sometime later that day. You know, it, it, it strikes me as not being unusual that when you have a police officer killed and the police think they know who might be the person who did it, that they would consider that person to be awfully dangerous and want to take measures in the conduct of taking that person into custody to make sure that none of them Bound up the way the other officer did, and so I'm wondering. I mean, do you think that that is? Like, I mean, what part of that is the overboard part? That, that's really kind of what I'm trying to figure out. I, I would say, Judge Yuri, you know, uh, a detonation grenade. Well, why do you need that? You surrounded the vehicle. I, yeah, all the officers have the weapons. I would just think they might want. They might argue, well, that they don't want him to be in a, in a state that he can make decisions that might end their life. Right while they're taking him into custody. And that's, that's probably why I, mean, I, would, I, I, admit, I admit there's a certain amount of speculation going on in my view of it, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it that way, and I'm wondering if I shouldn't, why not? I, I, I know that, for instance, you and I have seen kinds of cases where, you know, death of police officers. And it, it's fair to say that law enforcement act, and, and completely understandable, law enforcement act differently when they're arresting someone in a situation like this for the death of a fellow officer. And, and I think that's what escalates it in this case, especially given the grenade usage uh, and, and the uh, forcing of him to the ground and on the hood. Do you that, see that's it more as like a retaliatory uh, effect rather than a self-defense kind of posture that they might be exhibiting? Certainly a heightened use of force, Judge here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Counsel, we to, to build up that though. I mean, looking at it from the standpoint of what our test is going to be and how we're going to apply intellectual rigor to this, how would we be able to distinguish what are the things about this case that might distinguish this from a regular felony takeout? If he 
he's armed and dangerous. In those situations, police officers are going to be fairly aggressive. You have to do so. Is that going to, if we side with you, does that mean that in those kinds of situations, every type of those situations, we're now going to have to be saying, well, any state is going to be involved here? I think certainly look at the totality of the circumstances. Uh, absolutely, Judge Newell. And I think that uh, a view of the totality of the circumstances in this case, it's clear. Uh, the detonation grenade, uh, the way they handled him, firing the shotgun at him, putting him in fear of his life. We don't usually see that in our cases uh, as in the totality of the circumstances. But these facts were unusual. I agree. Right? Yeah. He's parked in front of the police station. He's just minding his own business. The police officer is. He has no idea that the defendant walks up to the vehicle and he just shoots him. Right? That, that's very true, Judge Richardson. That's the yeah. allegation. Well, like he was being arrested or anything. Say again, Your Honor? It wasn't like he was being arrested or anything. He just walked up to the vehicle and shot him. It, that's, that's our position. Okay. That's our um, and so then the third scene at the mag court uh, is very unusual. At the magistrate court, at mag court, you have the statements to uh, Brown, uh, Morris, and Enfinger. You know, a mag court, uh, we all know how sausage is made in mag court. You're, you're in there, it's not a polite environment. He's surrounded by at least 10 law enforcement officers who are armed, ordered to stand at a line for a search with the officers surrounding him. Uh, and then uh, he's questioned specifically by Brown, why did you shoot the officer? That has nothing to do with the mental health evaluation that Brown was asked to look at. Uh, no rights were read. And the same thing with Morris, uh, who uh, uh, was questioning him also. You know, they were concerned about the fact that they didn't think that an individual could get into the jail without re being required to answer their questions. And that's why we think, you know, the judge in the 379th found they were in custody. Uh, moving from there, uh, he found that the questions were not, you know, the subject of interrogation. We think, given the, you know, the, the whole totality of circumstances of what happened at the rest scene, what happened in the interrogation room, and what happened at the mag court, uh, we think those were uh, interrogation statements, uh, certainly stemming from the interrogation room. Counsel, even, even assuming that, um, how would the error be harmful? Well, Judge Slaughter, it, those are those are pretty horrible answers, uh, that, you know, that, that were given. You know, um, I mean, things like, uh, I, I'm glad I did it. I felt good doing it. Uh, now I've been seen. Why did they need those? That that's the big question. You know, the state didn't need those. The state in their brief said it was overwhelming argument. They say it's harmless because of this overwhelming evidence. But our position is well, it's kind of like a 403 objection. If it's, if it's overwhelming evidence, why do they need these, these iffy statements that were taken? Why didn't they just go with the evidence that they had? Because Judge Slaughter, those statements that were allegedly made by Mr. McCain at the bank court were, were uh, very, very uh, damning uh, to the, uh, especially going towards the special issues, special issue number one with future dangers. Counsel, counsel. But, so if you're comparing this to 43, though, like the thing about what he's saying here is he's actually direct. These are statements that are germane to the actual offense. That's not like a situation where he's saying some, something else that might not be related to the offense. If it's a gang or inflammatory. I mean, these are things that show his perspective on, on the crime itself, and it was a pretty bad crime. So I'm not so sure. Like, sure, you can say the state doesn't need them, but it certainly is something that would help make their case, right? Oh, well, I don't think so, Your Honor. I, they, the, the state said in their brief that Judge Newell, that they had overwhelming evidence, and that's why any error here was harmless. And so it's our position that, yes, it may have gone towards the statement, but it was clearly beyond the statements made in the uh, interrogation. Okay, Mr. Did you have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, so the jail intake assessor, his testimony was that the officer was trying to get the My reading of the record, Judge Irby, is that he's on the line, he's been searched, he's being quest uh, questioned, still surrounded by 10 law enforcement officers. That's my reading of the record. I, I didn't read it where he was off alone. So. Okay. That's uh, another question. Uh, if you don't mind, when, what would you say the officers should have done? Right? I mean, because we know what they did. The record reveals that. Great um, question, Judge. If, if it were, if you would tell us what sort of, because we're going to have to write an opinion to, to decide this. It's going to be read by future lawyers and judges and as a guidepost. And so we need to know, 
I think where where are the, the decision points, right? Where something different uh, might, have, might have been more, we would have been more confident about the voluntariness. Issue. I, I, I think given the fact that he was shot at, roughly handled at the arrest scene, EMS should have come in, EMTs look at him. Somebody come in that's not affiliated with the, uh, uh, with the Leos who, who can say that, uh, look, we've looked at you, you're doing fine, do you have any concerns? And something like that as, a, as an intervention. So you mean between, so I know there was a mental health person that came and visited with him, isn't that right? Did that occur after the interrogation where he gave up these statements, or was that before? So that was at the MAG court, uh, okay. Judge Year. Uh, okay, so that was prior to the interrogation then? Post-interrogation. Okay. Okay. My, my reading of the record is there was the arrest, mm -hmm. then the interrogation, and then the end finger, uh, who's our point of error uh, on here, he takes uh, Mr. McCain over to the MAG court for processing. By uh, Detective Duke, that's correct. And does, uh, that, does that person create a report that reflects uh, sort of mental trauma of the of the situation, or is there anything sort of medically that we can look to to, to demonstrate what it is you're telling us not he was I've, going through? Not that I've seen in the record, Judge. Okay. Here. Just, just to set the stage for this. Did you talk about the Mac Court? You have Judge Brother or whoever is in their county, and then but the Mac Court you're talking about is. They've taken him to the police station, and then they take him over to the booking scenario where they have a magistrate judge there. Is that, is that the one you're talking about? That, that's right, Judge Richardson. Okay. He, he's over at the jail for him processing with the man. And was there more than one person in line with him while that was taking place? Uh, that I've not seen in the record. I don't know that, Judge Richardson. Counsel, did you want to reserve some of your time? Five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate it. Please the court, opposing counsel, presiding Judge Keller, uh, Nathan Morey for the state of Texas in Bayer County. Um, if I could clear up a few things as to what Mr. Gross said in the court, have some questions on timeline. My recollection is, is there is a helicopter eagle video of Mr. McCain's arrest. I do not have the timestamp from that video in my immediate recollection, but that should be in the record. Um, I believe the record reflects that. Officer Enfinger, who was SAPD SWAT, transported him from the scene of arrest to the uh, poli downtown police station, the public safety headquarters. And uh, you know that's not a not a terrible drive uh, from where he's arrested. He was arrested on the east side of Bayer County, headed towards Houston. Um, Deputy uh, Chief Deputy McKay does appear on the. Um, interrogation video at approximately 6.17, and they do discuss the use of force that was uh, at issue at his arrest. I will concede that there's a greater amount of force that is uh, associated with a typical arrest. However, I would point out, I don't believe the trial judge made any findings of fact that shots were fired. There was what is called a flashbang device. Uh, I, I don't even think it would uh, qualify as a grenade. Um, it, makes a, it makes a light flash. I think there's smoke. It makes a loud noise. And We've all seen that in movies, right? Um, what is your position as to when he's first given his Miranda rights? I believe he's first given his Miranda rights by Detective Duke at Public Safety Headquarters on video before he's asked any incriminating questions. And before they carry on with an interrogation, he voices that he understands his rights and that he acknowledges being read them uh, at least twice. Once to Detective Duke and the second time to Chief Deputy McKay. I'm sorry, the Assistant Deputy McKay. Um, Can you angle the microphone a little bit for you? Can you hear me now? Um, Did well, he waive his rights? Yes. And um, I, I would also note that one of the things that prompted Detective Duke to read him his rights is, is uh, Otis McCain was actively complaining about the fact that he had not been read his rights at the scene of arrest which, of course, is not a requirement. The requirement is triggered upon interrogation, and there's no evidence that anybody at the scene of arrest interrogated Mr. McCain. Nor in the car? Nor in the car. I believe uh, Enfinger said that, that they, they go to the same building where McCain had shot uh, Detective Marconi in front, and Enfinger said, you know, 
no questioning, but he did say when they passed by the scene of the shooting, McCain glances over at the place where McCar uh, Marconi's vehicle was pulled up behind another motorist where he was writing a, a traffic citation. Uh, there's, no, there's no verbal exchange between the two that have, uh, is reflected in the record. Um, there's no connection between the person who had been pulled over for the traffic infraction and the defendant. No. So the defendant had, a, had approached the public safety headquarters uh, several minutes, if not an hour before. Uh, he had walked into the public safety headquarters uh, and he had spoken to the person behind the, the counter there. And he wanted, he wanted police assistance in a child custody dispute. And of course the police department, that, that's a court matter, the police department can't interfere with those. So he was turned away, essentially, I think. Um, but you do see his vehicle kind of circle with the surveillance, his vehicle circles several times. That's one of the ways they identify him as the unique uh, tire rims uh, that his vehicle um, uh, had. So he does return later, and, and by his own admission, uh, he just randomly picks Detective Marconi because Detective Marconi is there writing a citation. There's no, there's no real personal connection between McCain and Marconi or, or McCain and the motorist. So the record, though, reflects, I, I believe, that there was a gap where they left him alone for some period of time, up to an hour maybe? Yes, I think, more. I, I think that's pretty typical with interrogations. Is they, you know, they, a person's arrested, and a lot of times they'll just set them down and kind of give them a cooling period. You know, let, their, let their pulse relax, let them become comfortable in the environment before the detective comes in. Um, and I, you know, if you watch the, the, if you watch the interrogation video, um, Detective Duke, he, he's a very nice interrogator. A lot of detectives have a different approach, and he's definitely the uh, carrot rather than the stick uh, in this case. Uh, he, he tries to make McCain feel good, and he tries to sympathize with McCain. They talk about, you know, he talks about his ex-wife and McCain's ex-wife and child custody, and, and uh, you know, there's there's really to, to call this a coercive uh, interrogation or a coercive waiver would uh, stretch, stretch the bounds of, of what it means to be. Well, conversely, this isn't a situation where he's being so nice he might be overbearing to apply promises or things like for deception. So I think what Mr. Gross was getting at is uh, there was there was an indication that they were going to look into the use of force, mm -hmm. and I don't know if the trial judge made a, a direct finding on that or not, but I I, I, I think uh, Detective Duke testified at the suppression hearing that 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 was really they told him that to kind of make him feel good, but that was never. There was never a quid pro quo, like, if you talk to me about what you've done over the last 48 hours, I'll talk to the you know, use of force people uh, or internal affairs. There was never any kind of quid pro quo. In fact, they were very separate. And in fact, um, I would note there's a, uh, in the, in, early on in the interrogation, Ms. McCain does say, the only reason I'm talking to you and I forget his exact words, but, but he talks about just kind of his whole life and being, being frustrated. And it really, he doesn't mention anything at that point about the arrest or about any injuries or about any threats that were made. I mean, he does not directly, he never directly addresses any kind of direct threat or coercion that was intended to cause him to make a statement at any point. Are you aware of any cases written by any court ever? that have suggested that the, the trauma of suffered by a defendant while being taken into custody was sufficient to carry over and cause a statement that was later given to become involuntary? I, I thought I cited something in my brief. Um, the court has it. Um, I, I know that the, you know, just the mere fact of an uncomfortable arrest, I mean, it, it would certainly, when you're talking about voluntariness, whether it's the voluntariness of a waiver or the voluntariness of statement. That would be part of the totality of the circumstances. So it's it's in there just I like just everything else. It but would be sort of an extraordinary thing for us to say in right. court that he suffered terrible trauma. They should have waited much longer before they chose to interrogate. If the court were to find that in this case, mm -hmm. but I, this, is, this is a more aggressive arrest and understandably so. Mm -hmm. But it is not, it is not it's not unique. 
people are arrested under these circumstances on a fairly regular basis, even though it may not be the ordinary course of arrest. And, and counsel, wasn't it about two hours between the time of arrest and the time of the interrogation? That, that sounds about right. I know if, if, if they talked to him about 8.17, and I know this was in November, um, and it's, it is daylight when he's arrested. So he's arrested sometime kind of in the afternoon. Because um, I know he did, this was actually the day after the murder, because he had spent the night at a hotel. He had been to the courthouse to get married to his girlfriend that morning. And then after the wedding at the courthouse, then they left um, for Houston, where he was apprehended uh, on the east side of Bear County. Counsel, is your reading of the record that uh, the police were being honest about we're going to look into all this stuff or was it <clears throat> and, and also saying another question did they look into it do you know uh, I, I, I do believe Detective Duke addressed that my, my recollection is I don't think he looked into it I, I think he did say you know I was just trying to make him feel comfortable and I, I'm going to kind of parallel your question to what Judge Yuri was talking about. And Judge Yuri's talking about the use of force. Is there a, an example where the use of force can override voluntariness? And I think what the case law says as to deception is deception in and of itself does not render a confession involuntary. And really what the deception, in order for it to render a confession involuntary or a waiver involuntary, is it has to override the suspect's like ability to make a free decision. And, and I think what, when you, there are instances, I think, where police will, will, will use, like, you know, I, I don't know the case, but I think I was looking this up where they wanted to enter a house, enter a house, and they say, we're looking for a rapist. Can we enter the house? Now, they were actually using that as a ruse to get in the house, but because of the gravity of the situation, you know, the court found that that was too much, and any person would just let the police in on that deception. But here the deception doesn't really, it doesn't really go to the ultimate act of voluntariness. It just goes to sort of making him feel comfortable in the setting uh, versus it doesn't really bear upon his will in a way that, you know, a normal person would just give in and, and, and talk. And it's also very common that police officers lie to the people they're interrogating and that's okay. Police officers, they make deceptions during interrogations. They make deceptions in order to enter houses. They can go undercover. Um, yeah, they, and it is, it is a, a, you know, not a regular practice, but a fairly common practice for police to kind of to, 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 to see. Counsel, uh, what are your thoughts about the effect that McCain's statements might have had during the punishment phase? Like, I mean, if we're talking about harm and all that stuff, what, what effect do you think his statements might have had for the jury's ultimate <coughs> You know, I, in this case, the jury saw a video of a gun go into a car right next to a police officer's head and two shots get fired. And I think even if you were to take out his statements, I think he did that. And I mean, there's at least four different witnesses that were subject to the suppression hearing. So if you were to take all four of those out, you would still understand this case the same way. It doesn't, it doesn't change the character. Without that, he still went to the police station to, uh, to, 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 to grieve about the child custody matter. There's still, um, you know, evidence uh, during punishment of him talking to the news media where he's just kind of ranting about um, the police and his, you know, how upset he is. So when, he, when you get, by the time you get to punishment, it, I think the narrative of the case is the same. And, and I will also, he assaulted, uh, deputies who had custody of him right after his guilty verdict was returned. So um, I think the jury had a pretty good picture, with or without those statements, of why McCain was mad, who he was mad at, which were people in uniform, police, people of uh, law enforcement, um, who, sim who sim uh, symbolized law enforcement. Uh, I, I don't know that the statements really bared on that uh, any more than the other evidence that was also and I, I think, I think his, in terms of guilt innocence, his uh, identity, his intent, and his knowledge of Marconi's status was thoroughly proved. And, and you know, obviously, the, the act uh, was a <coughs> lethal act. There's no question there. So I don't. I think it would be hard to find harm on any given point of error in this case. I think the court would struggle to find any any recognizable harm. In his 
assessing um, the trauma and how that might carry over <coughs> from, uh, the potential giving of an involuntary statement. Uh, do you think it might be helpful for us to consider uh, cases that have uh, have involved the excited utterance exception to the hearsay rule? Is that would that be completely off course, or is, do you think there's any relationship <coughs> between you know, the traumatic event and the statements that are given in terms of the correlation about the voluntariness of those statements that are later given? Is that have you thought about that at all? I, I see. I, you're saying that because the the excited utterance rule doesn't really go to someone being compelled to speak. I think it goes to the truth of what they're saying. Right. Okay. Essentially. I you want to split the time. Yes. And your time is almost gone. Okay. I was just going to finish up. I, I think that goes to the, the compulsion. It does not go to the compulsion aspect, but rather the truth of the underlying statement. And I will reserve the remaining time for Mr. Ward. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Oh, State. I'll actually be discussing the alternates, which I know Mr. Gross didn't get a chance to go to. Okay, of course. <laughs> I'll be discussing the alternates. I know Mr. Gross didn't get a chance to discuss them, um, but I just wanted to go over the issue in case the court has any uh, questions on it. Uh, this court has said that a mistrial request is an extreme remedy and it should only be resorted to and less drastic measures uh, would not cure any kind of prejudice that might have occurred. Um, this court has also said that um, questioning the jurors um, and the people involved um, are is one of those less drastic remedies. This court has also said that the trial court is in the best position to judge the credibility of those questions, and it's also said that reviewing courts must defer to those credibility determinations. In this case, the trial court instructed the alternates, the board of review again, do not in any way of discussing. Well, could you back up and sort of explain what you mean by alternates for the audience and explain what yeah. happened so that they understand the context of so just, I mean, as the court knows, uh, generally whenever there is a, a trial, uh, especially a, a big one like a death penalty case, there are some, uh, many times there will be alternate jurors. They're not part of the jury um, per se, but they are, they have the same qualifications, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this court earlier this year ruled that sending them back with the, the jury is error. At the time this case was decided, that had not been decided yet, um, but it is now decided that that was an error um, to, to have that. So the jurors, the trial court instructed the alternates beforehand, don't participate in deliberations um, and do not vote on the verdict. And to ensure that they complied with those um, instructions, the next day the trial court called the, uh, the alternates out and the jury foreman. He had them all three sworn in and all three agreed that the alternates did not deliberate in any way and they did not vote on the verdict. The uh, uh, appellant makes a um, kind of hay about a short conversation that took place just before um, deliberations began. But in that conversation, the alternates literally told the jury, we can't talk about the case with you. Um, we're just supposed to be basically wallflowers here. Um, appellant also makes hay about the fact that he was not given a chance to request a special instruction um, on the alternates. But he's never identified, either below or in this court, how the instruction that he wanted would have been different from the one actually given to the alternates relate to the jury and complied with. Um, this court has, the earlier in Becerra, um, this court relied on a United States Supreme Court case called Le uh, Leno, Alano, um, where that court said that if the jurors don't participate, if they don't vote, they're basically no different than a book that's just sitting in the room with them, um, an unexamined book. And I think that's exactly, the trial court was very um, kind of, they had the foresight to see, we need to make the record clear that that's what happened here. Didn't one of the jurors, though, involve uh, himself with one of the alternate jurors at one point in some sort of a statement or question? The, at the very, very beginning, before deliberations began, that's what all three of the two alternates and the jury foreman, before deliberations began, somebody said something along the lines of, what, of basically, what did the trial court tell you? Um, just Because you know, they were taken out into the hallway, mm -hmm. and they said, we're not supposed to participate in deliberations. Um, and then again, all and we're not supposed to vote. And again, all three of them agreed that that's exactly what happened. Was there an opportunity for the defense to know that the alternates were going back into the jury room? No, not at the time. Um, and they did request that. They did 
object to the fact that they weren't able to get that special instruction. But again, I just don't think that there's any harm considering they've never identified what the instruction would have been that was already given and complied with. Um, also, in addition to this kind of no showing of prejudice, um, the kind of prejudice that Mr. Morey was just talking about, the evidence was overwhelming in this case. Um, there's video evidence, there's witness statements, um, there's, if you get to this issue, there's appellate's own statements to show that he committed a crime. And in, in, in short, the jury would have found him guilty no matter what. Um, the evidence overwhelming of guilt. On this record, there's not really any indication, though, that the alternate jurors had any effect on the delivery. No, like everybody was in agreement. Again, the trial court is allowed to find them credible, and it obviously did here. Everybody agreed that the alternates sat in the back. They didn't make any, you know, they didn't roll their eyes. They didn't make any sighs or anything like that. They just no, sat part there. of the instructions too. Don't roll your eyes. Yeah, exactly. He literally said, "Don't roll your eyes. Uh, you know, don't do anything to indicate your thoughts about this case, and don't vote." And again, that's exactly what happened. So I think the harm, error, the harm standard uh, identified by Becerra, and that has essentially been um, also adopted by the U.S. Supreme Court. It, there's just no way to get over the, the, the very low um, harm standard in this case. So unless there's any other questions, state phrase of the judgment be affirmed. Thank you, Your Point verified five, the Batson uh, error. I want to point out a few things, if I could, please, to the court. You know, uh, <clears throat> volume 15 of the record pages 74 to 139, uh, that juror, number 24, was seated as juror four in the case and was pretty shaky on, on that juror's view of police officers in general. Uh, juror number seven, who was the second uh, person seated on the jury at volume 12, pages 111 to 161, <coughs> said, <coughs> said, I could not return a death verdict. Under no circumstances could I assess the death penalty the death penalty is never justified for one person, and if the alternative is LWAP, life without the possibility of parole, then never would I go with the death penalty. And that was at volume 12, pages 151 to 157. Yet that juror was seated. <coughs> juror number 71 said the criminal justice system is imperfect. This was at volume 25 of the record, pages 4 to 57. Hesitant that that veneer person could assess the death penalty, and said, I'm not ready to sentence someone to death at volume 25, page 56, yet that person was seated as juror in the case. Juror number 50, uh, at volume 20, pages 97 to 150, said that the criminal justice system is imperfect and the death penalty has been applied unfairly uh, because of uh, uh, racial bias. And of course, we'll assume that you had a problem with all of these jurors and state. Right, right, that, that very good. Uh, uh, juror number 61 at volume 23, pages 4 to 54, said had a problem with racism in policing. Uh, some police officers are good, some bad. Uh, the death penalty has been wrongly used in the past because of racial prejudice. And then juror number 119 at volume 35, pages 60 to 121, who became the foreperson of, the, of this case, said there was a problem with racism in policing, there are bad apples in law enforcement. Uh, seeing how police actions have evolved over time in the U.S. has changed my standpoint. Uh, no reason for the death penalty if there's life without the possibility of parole. And most telling, on a scale of one to zero, how often would you assess death? As questionnaire, uh, he said, I'm a two, with 10 being all the time. And then during the uh, board dire, volume 35, pages 114 to 115, he said, I'm a one maybe a two. Yet that person got on the uh, jury also. And it's our well, position. Yeah. Counsel, the, the, really it seems like you're focused on the fact that these people would not want to assess the death penalty as reasons for not striking them. Um, but the, the juror of which you complain uh, was really more about the guilt in it. Her comments were really more about the guilt innocence phase. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, I think Judge Slaughter, I, I understand what you're saying. Our position is racism is the key throughout here, what I just said. Concerned by white veneer people about racism because the, the state in this case said we're getting rid of number 30 
because of her social media postings in view of the police being racist. And so these other veneer people are seated <clears throat> as juror numbers 4, 2, 9, 7, 8, and 12, yet number 30 doesn't get seated. And number 30 was most telling, I think, Judge Slaughter, is that uh, she is a uh, conservative, agreed with beyond reasonable doubt standard, in favor of death and composed death, death penalty is just and necessary, uh, would answer the special issues based on the evidence. Uh, she said no police officer should ever be killed and would not automatically disbelieve an officer merely because he was an officer, volume 16, page 101. It's our position, Judge Slaughter, that, that the reasons given by the state uh, where we're concerned about her social media posting uh, it is, is not enough to overcome, uh, we think, uh, what, what was the case in this, is that the court's decision uh, was not supported by the record and it's clearly erroneous because we think it was merely a pretext to conceal discrimination uh, on the striking of juror number 30. Um, and we think that it's the racist part, uh, a concern with racism, I should say, by these other six jurors that were seated on the jury, yet they weren't sh stricken by the prosecutor during Fort Dyer. Uh, no uh, peremptories were used against them, and yet a peremptory was used against the African-American veneer person number three, 30. After and, a request for a cause, or cause strike, correct? Uh, that's correct, Judge Slaughter. Uh, the uh, uh, cause challenge was denied by the court, uh, and so the state uh, uh, exercised a peremptory. You're right. There, there was at least one uh, black juror seated. Am I, am I wrong to remember that? So, it's kind of hard to tell in the record, okay. Judge Yuri. I think yes is the answer to that. All right. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of hard to tell. And, you know, well, I'm, I'm guessing, I think it was juror number uh, 48 was the black female juror who was seated. I'm not sure. I'm if, sorry. If we can include that that person was indeed a black juror who was seated, was there anything distinguishing about the, uh, the questioning of that person that might lead us to, to believe that there was some reason other than race that the, the prosecutor decided to keep that person versus remove them? The, uh, the, the, the tenor of, of the questioning, um, so juror number, it is, ended up being juror number six. I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm going over present judge. It um, was number 48. Now, she, was a, she served as a four person. Uh, on a prior jury uh, that convicted and sentenced. And so, as, as we all know, that's very appealing uh, to a prosecutor on a case. And I think that's the distinction uh, between number 30 and, and number 6. Because number 30, as we know, is working in the, uh, her sister's office uh, off and on, uh, which, uh, the, uh, which the ADA is focused on. Thank you all so much. A uh, uh, pleasure being in front of you. Thank you.
interfere with that expectation of privacy. Carpenter suggested seven days of it. We also have a case called Sims. It's like three hours of real time information is not going to interfere with an expectation of privacy. This was like two hours. So doesn't this case, particularly this geo benchmark, fall right into a completely acceptable window of time whereby it's not an unreasonable expectation or intrusion on the expectation of privacy? Your Honor, um, it is our position that Google location history is qualitatively different from business records, okay. such as phone numbers dialed, bank records, or even CSLI data. It has the capacity to reveal the intimacies of life in a short time frame. The user does not voluntarily convey sensitive data to Google in any meaningfully sense. Yeah, any counsel, how can you say that they don't voluntarily do that? They have to opt in, and, and there's a message displayed when they opt in um, informing them that, that this will be you know, recorded for, for Google's purposes. And then Google then uses, it sells that information to other people. So doesn't really Google own that information pursuant to an agreement by the, the user? Your Honor, it's our position that the opt-in warnings are hardly transparent, and it would be reasonable to believe, based on the warnings, that the data would be saved locally on the device itself and not to Google. In Google's general privacy statement, it says, quote, you can turn on location history if you want to create a private map of where you go with your signed-in device, unquote. And the only other reference in the general privacy statement refers to using Google location history for traffic patterns. Nothing about enabling location history details how frequently Google will record a user's location, the amount of location history data it collects, that even if the user stops tracking, the tracking is only paused, how precise the location history can be, that Google will automatically track your location even when you're not doing anything on your phone, or that this tracking would occur across all devices into which the user is logged in, not just those in which they opted in, and even when the user deletes the respective Google app that they originally opted in on. Further, users do not waive their privacy rights with the state just because these invasive technologies are not fully automatic or because not every single user utilizes them. As Judge Wynn stated in the Chatter dissent, it is a grave misjudgment to conflate an individual's limited disclosure to Google with an open invitation to the state. Further, this data has other characteristics um, that make it different from data that courts have previously analyzed. First, the data's comprehensiveness. As with CSLI, location history tracks a smartphone's location and can provide near-perfect surveillance of its user. And like CSLI, location history is collected with sufficient frequency to be able to faithfully track. But Google location history goes further. It is more precise and it is generated much more frequently. This precision matters because it means the location history data is much more potent. A little goes a long way. It can reveal the same kind of private information with much fewer data points. Like it can identify if you're, if you're in a home, <coughs> in a church, and previously the only identification might be in a neighborhood or a zip code. It also tracks the user's movements every two minutes from multiple data connections, GPS, Wi-Fi access points, Bluetooth sensors, and mobile network information. But, this but I, I hear what you're saying, Emma, by the same token, we're still also talking about very <coughs> temporal search for this information compared to CSLI information. All those things that are said about CS, CSLI information is in, implicit in that discussion of the Supreme Court decisions is that this is going to take over a long period of time. And in this situation, it's so much more limited that even if you wanted to say there's some kind of an issue, it's not a very, very significant one. And that seems to be, for me, the thing that you see in cases like SIPS, in cases like Harper, in cases like Ford. <laughs> I want to say that this would be an intrusion if it lasted for a long time. The fact that it didn't last for very long at all makes it not an intrusion. Um, Your Honor, it's our position that short-term searches, short searches are no less intimate by virtue of their limited duration. <laughs> it's the character of the search, not the length. Okay. The fact that this is a geofence intrusion and it involves a retrospective for years, continuous, near-perfect surveillance technology, which enters private areas and captures information that was historically unavailable to uninitiated human senses. So the government could learn a great deal about the user in this situation in the 2.5 hours of surveillance that law enforcement authorized. Could tour a person's home, capture their romantic rendezvous, 
revealed familial, political, professional, religious, and sexual associations. I'd like to point out that the question that's pivotal, pivotal in determining these factors and whether location history data is different is its capability to reveal intimate private details. But, but counsel, it, in learning what Judge Newell said, you know, when you're talking about a two hour time frame, it's not gonna encompass all of that information. Maybe there's one or two things that it reveals, um, but it's a very, very narrow window. So you're not, it's not like a, you know, following someone for, for days on end uh, to know exactly where they went. It's, it's a two hour time frame. But a lot can happen in two hours. Your Honor, and that is our position. That it's the capability of the data. It's not necessarily what, like a post hoc examination of what the results revealed. It's the capability of the data. It can reveal, you know, your movements in constitutionally protected spaces in 2.5 hours is, a, is can be a significant time frame. That's a, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. That's a very interesting point because if you look at things like Jones, and even if you want to draw the, the parallel to CS, CSLI, these are things that are giving us information right in the public. Was right. there any information, though, that in this situation where Google put, put or gave location or the information was seized that went into, say, a home or in, into a place that would not otherwise be ascertained by the public? Your Honor, the record is not clear on that. Okay. Isn't it kind of ubiquitous? I mean, there's, I can I can remember being with people, I don't know if it's ever happened to me, but being with people where we walk into a store and then they joke about the fact that, oh, look at that, I just got an ad that popped up about this store. Isn't that curious, you know, that they know exactly where we are? I mean, I think there's a, a point at which we all know this is going on, and I wonder if, um, if it might be more incumbent upon the citizenry to act in the form of legislation that tells Google, don't do that anymore, Google, right? Rather than to say that when everybody knows Google's doing it, Google knows they're doing it, law enforcement knows Google's doing it, why can't law enforcement take advantage of something that's readily available that everybody knows about? Your Honor, it's our position that not everybody knows exactly how intrusive this geofence information or this kind of Google location history data can be. I mean, I personally wasn't aware of how invasive it was until I started researching this case. I mean, it tracks your data, it tracks your location every two minutes. It is capable of following you almost like an ankle monitor into every constitutionally protected space that you go. And to um, give that kind of... But to talk about it in terms of the capabilities that did not get exercised in this particular case, isn't that sort of like blowing up the whole world for the sake of a bad thing that happened in one spot? You know, I mean, there's we're focused, I think, on on privacy interest at a particular moment in time in a particular geographical space, aren't we? Not some we're not trying to find everything about a human being through this technology. First of all, I don't know. We don't know in this case whether it followed um, any of the suspects in the second stage of the Google protocol into constitutionally protected spaces. That is not in the record. So that very well could have happened. Um, second of all, like I keep emphasizing, it's the capabilities of the data. What can this data reveal? I mean, I, I think we, we don't um, penalize the user because the government's uh, request didn't happen to stray into constitutionally protected territory. How, wide, how widespread is the use of this geo uh, situation? I mean, I, I, my understanding is that, pe that people have been, or law enforcement has been seeking geofence warrants since 2016, and it has ex exponentially grown every year. Are there any records of uh, corruption to the information? <coughs> well, there's certainly records of sweeping uh, innocent people up in geofence searches. For instance, there's an example of a, a person who was riding his bike back and forth through, a, a, you know, accidentally through um, an offense location, and he had a, a bike tracker on his bike that was clocking him using Google location history data, and he was swept up in a um, search. 
and took some time before he could reveal why, why he was bike riding by the offense instead of part of it. I thought I read, I thought I read that there were two people whose names were acquired that were not connected to this offense. Is that right? That's correct. There were, um, the end result was three names, Eva Baltzigar, Gary Ryder, and Aaron Wells. And those first two names, uh, no one knows how they're connected or why they have no connection. Okay, and as far as your position, you, I take it you agree with the Fifth Circuit that yes. uh, censor law is on general, general, general warrant and that it doesn't matter so much what the filter is that's in the warrant as the fact that this entire thing is going to be searched every time you do it. That's correct. Council, to follow up on that, uh, we're talking a little bit about the third party doctrine and things of this nature. What is the analytical framework that, we're, that you were asking us to fit the intrusion into? Like, there was an illusion about shouldn't we expect the legislature to enact laws that limit Google's access? But then you've also mentioned, you've mentioned specifically the idea that we don't expect Google to, uh, or we don't expect that when we give this stuff to Google, that Google will use it as uh, extensively as they, they might. Is this something you see as fitting within the reasonable expectation of privacy test? Is this something that we need to consider possibly a positive law situation where we look to see whether or not there's actual legislation or from statutes out there that might limit the scope and those suggest that there's an expectation of privacy? What is the analytical framework that we would be trying to use assuming there is an intrusion? Um, we are, it's our position that the third party doctrine does not apply and the warrant as is, is a general warrant. Okay. So to the extent that what legislation could do to change that, I don't know. Um, I'm not prepared to speak on that. But the next phase of our argument would be that the third party doctrine does not apply and there was no probable cause or particularity for the warrant as it existed. Okay. Clarify something for me. So the geofencing that law enforcement essentially gets the location of either witnesses or suspects, which may or may not benefit the case. How do they get to the next step to get all that information? Where, where does the probable cause come from? I mean, I'm assuming they're getting, assuming they're going to want to get into the phone after that, correct? Not just the location. Um, are you asking about the, uh, <coughs> the warrant itself? Yes. I mean, you know, first there's, the, affidavit, the, the regular affidavit of probable cause, that authorizes the initial search of the sensor vault, the 592 million users in the sensor vault. And then after that, Google and law enforcement are negotiating to see which of those might have some connection to the offense based on their judgment. There, right? Is that basically Sorry. it? Because they're in the vicinity. That's, that's, that's all correct. the information they're getting. Right. Nothing Only else. The, yes. Yes, Your Honor. Isn't that kind of, I mean, when we, uh, law enforcement typically will canvas the scene of a crime and will find witnesses who might, people who might have seen what was happening and ask them questions and get their information, their phone number, their address, their name. They're going to be gathering that kind of information even if they're not using technology. Isn't that true? Well, Your Honor, that would be them going out into the, the known crime scene and or the known area surrounding the crime scene and, and asking specific witnesses, um, you know, that's going to be different <laughs> from running through 592 million users to see if any of them happen to be in the crime scene at the time of the offense. So you're, the way you, you're proposing this, though, is that like there's a person coming through this information. It's just a computerized search <coughs> for, that meets the parameters. And what about the fact that the, the geofence warrant doesn't initially target a particular individual? Uh, it only reveals um, anonymized information. And, uh, and then, you know, even that's just for that small area where the crime happened, um, you know, so, so how, I guess, what, what is your take on that? How does that play into this? Are you asking about whether the warrant has individualized probable cause? So when you're talking about as a, as a general warrant, not, not probable cause, it's just that it, it's it's like what Judge you're saying, it's part of an investigation, finding out who was there, um, and, and 
so it's not even giving the initial report doesn't give any names. It just you know doesn't identify who's there. Just that there's these devices there in that time period. Um, and then and even then they have to go through a couple of extra steps to find out, narrow it down, and find out who is there. Well, first of all, we we argue that the extra steps um, are without court guidance and therefore patently illegal. But as to the initial unindividualized search of 592 million users that produces some anonymized data, I mean, that is the exact hallmark of an unparticularized warrant. I mean, it's overbroad, completely overbroad, with no, no parameters, no judicial parameters on how that search is done. And there is certainly evidence within the case law that you can determine who those devices are even if the, when they're anonymized, because you're now seeing where they're going. So how, how would this be any different, though, say if a police officer goes to businesses in the area and requests their surveillance footage? Well, in that sense, I mean, law enforcement is not going to the business with the aim to determine whether that person's committing a crime. So that's exactly what's happening with the geofence. They're trying to expose perpetrators. Wouldn't that be what you would find in the surveillance video? Is who committed the offense, who was there, who might know, have more information? But you're going to a specific place of business with a, a known video of the crime scene. So is, but isn't that what, what's happening here, is that law enforcement is going to a particular business, Google, knowing that they might not be able to reveal information about who was there and, and help law enforcement so I think that that is um, a, a fallacy in the state's argument that they're substituting Google for the individual users they're seeking to search. Google is not a witness or suspect to the complainant's robbery murder. Google does not own or control location history data that users do. Google does not generate or keep the loca location history data that users do. It belongs to the individuals, numerous tens of millions of them, and a geofence warrant seeks to search every one of their accounts. Thank you.